Swarna from JFJS Research Center. Welcome all of you to the Masterclass Series 2. And this is the lecture 2. And all of us are very lucky to hear to Professor Dr. Muhammad Aminul Islam. So I have been, um, had been, I should say, um, attending webinars as well as the development program that was, uh, you know, invited as a resource person and, uh, you know, requested him to deliver a lecture to all of us. Now, uh, before I can hand over the entire session to him, um, I would like to introduce him. Professor Dr. Muhammad Aminul Islam, sir, um, is currently working as a professor in the finance division of the Faculty of Applied and Human Sciences at University Malaysia Pernas. He received his bachelor's degree from International Islamic University, Malaysia, MBA and doctorate in philosophy from uh, University Science, Malaysia. He also completed an advanced diploma in teaching in higher education from Nottingham Trent University. Um, apart from this, um, Yitsa received the Raffles Education Founders Award for the most deserving academic staff of Olympia College Malaysia 2006. Excellent Academic Support Report 2009 the Best Lecturer Award in 2010, the Best Supervisor Award in 2018 and 2019 for seeing the most number of PhD graduates, the Research Excellence Award in 2020 and 2021 at University Malaysia Perlis. He also won the Best PhD Thesis Award 2011. I welcome you, sir. And it's indeed an honor for all of us to have you here um uh, for uh, delivering a beautiful lecture and um all of us are aware of the fact that the lecture titled is overcoming the barriers of the research and i think this is something which we all would like to know from you sir and i would appreciate it that yes all of us um, can hear to him without any disturbance and in case you have got any kind of doubts or um or something that you would like to clarify chat box is available kindly use it and after the session is over we will definitely take up some of your questions so i welcome you once again and now you can come up with your presentation so thank you sir. all right uh, thank you very much dr ramani sharma uh, for inviting me uh, to share uh, some experiences based on my exposure as supervisor, external, external examiners, and uh, as well as uh, being mentoring uh, hundreds of PhD students worldwide. Okay, um, those of us have already completed uh, the PhD journey. We know how uh, challenging it was, how difficult it was. And how did you, uh, how did we cross uh, each barrier when you faced during our journey? All right, uh, those of you who are doing PhD now, uh, I'm very sure uh, many of you are finding it challenging, complex, difficult. <laughs> and um, you may not be able to find any PhD student in the world who has never thought of quitting, <laughs> never thought of quitting, <laughs> including me. Uh, during the journey uh, to some point we reach, uh, we'll feel like I would like to drop out. <clears throat> PhD is not for me. I'm going to drop out from the program. And research data shows worldwide, 50% students will drop out from the PhD program. Eh? 50%. The highest among all programs that are, that are offered by universities. Okay undergraduate diploma masters phd that all programs phd program has the highest number of the props eh? highest number of the props but we, we we remember that people who decide to do phd they are not ordinary students eh? 
they are not ordinary students. Usually, the high performing student, and it is usually students who are ambitious and have some kind of dream to shine as an academic in the future. Only this kind of people will think of undertake the PhD journey. So while we see that very enthusiastic, motivated student, highly performing students undertake PhD journey, and yet the graduation rate is only 50%, uh, 50%. And that is a serious concern for many of us. Those are now working as academic in different parts of the world. And that's why when uh, Madam Ramani Shorna approached me a uh, few days back and asked me whether I would be available, and uh, I said, OK, uh, usually I prefer to get the invitation two weeks before since my schedule is very packed. But last time I let her down, I, I said, I'm sorry, you have to notice me earlier. But this time I said, OK. Uh, I will accept it. And uh, then she said, uh, what kind of topic would you like to uh, you know, choose? Then I said, okay, let me talk something uh, which is uh, relevant to every PhD student. Okay, so that's how the topic was chosen. Uh, uh, overcoming barriers of research or overcoming challenges of research. So before even we start our PhD journey, uh, we already have some challenges, right? Uh, finding out the right university, the right supervisor, the funding sources, and, and many other issues are there. Huh? Uh, even uh, if we fail to get the right supervisor, it could be a very good university, but not you didn't get a supervisor which is compatible with you. You might be ending up quitting the PST. And one of the primary reasons for a PhD student to quit is the supervisor, the attitudes and behavior, uh, you know, of, of the supervisors, okay? And many students, uh, about 20% students worldwide, data shows 20% PhD students will change their supervisor to certain extent, certain time. And uh, many students, including me, uh, will change the title, the topic, uh, after spending six months or even a year, myself, when I proposed a topic for PhD journey, I got admitted after three months, I changed. And then after six months, again, I changed. Huh? <laughs> so the third topic was the final topic that I carried on in my PhD journey. Okay. So with that introduction, let me share the slide with you. And then uh, I will... Uh, start talking from the slides, okay? Well, um, so I put it as overcoming challenges of research. Uh, it's a similar thing, right? We're coming barriers of research or challenges of research. And uh, those of you are new, I see many faces are very well known. Uh, some are very loyal followers. Uh, anyway, I go, they'll follow me. <laughs> I see many well known faces are there in my webinars. I do have a YouTube channel, Platform for Research and Development is dedicated for Resources. If you would like to uh, get to know, you can go and see. I have about 110 videos I would uh, know, upload it for you. Uh, you, you may uh, explore and see how uh, beneficial it could be for you. Let me start with this. Success is a vehicle which moves, which moves on the wheel, the name called hard work. Huh? Success is the wheel which moves on the wheel named hard work. But the journey is impossible without the fuel named self-confidence, okay? <laughs> All right. So uh, these two are very important for a PhD student. When you enroll, definitely you have to have the self-confidence in you. You have to have any confidence in you that you are competent enough you have the ability, you have the capability to undertake the PhD journey. Now, uh, when you have that confidence, then only you take up the PhD journey. That is the first thing that you need to have. The second one, of course, of course, the second one would be the hard work. Hard work. Personally, myself, I don't believe in 
be smart in study. Eh? I believe in hard work, not be smart work, hard work. Um, I believe in 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration, eh? meaning that 99% hard work and 1% luck. That's what I believe. Nothing comes in the world with easy, you know, easy way. It doesn't come. Even if you want to have a breakfast in the morning, it doesn't come just in front of you on a plate. Huh? It takes some effort, either you or your mom or somebody, just to put some effort to get the food on the table. Okay, and even to have it, still you have to put some hard work there huh, to eat. <laughs> a tasty food that you like so much, and sometimes you may struggle to eat that. Okay, so everything that you do, these two are very important, especially when it comes to PhD, even more important. Having self confidence. And we are saying that without self confidence, it is impossible. That is the fuel. Being motivated, being inspired, being confident that you can do it. That the attitude you need to have. If others can do it, why not I? No, that kind of attitude you must have. Then I'm sure you won't be able to quit the PhD program that you dream for a long time, all right? And once you have the self-confidence, definitely you have to put a lot of hard work. Huh? I have seen many of my PhD colleagues. He stayed four or five days continuously in the PhD study room. They take shower there. They just quickly go out to the, for the food and bring inside and they eat. They sleep there. They do everything in the PhD room for seven days, even two weeks. Some even I think two to three months, you know. They do not waste even a minute. To make sure they do things on time okay so that's how it is phd is not a simple thing and that's why phd some people say permanent head damage some people say permanent hair damage all sort of things are there but i myself i call it as permanent happiness degree permanent happiness degree that will only come when you are confident you are inspired you are motivated to pursue it and you put a lot of hard work into it then definitely it will become a permanent happiness degree because once you complete the PhD and do a good PhD, I'm going to talk about number of challenges. Through that, I'm going to give you some tips and tricks, you know, making your life a bit easier, all right, to complete your PhD degree, all right? Now, uh, I may not waste time on it, but I just want to remind you, uh, research is basically uh, solving a problem. If you do not have a problem that is affecting people or society industry then you should not be doing a research please keep that in mind a research always starts with a problem we walk around meet around we collaborate and meet up with people we socialize and we see certain things affecting people or industry or nation we pick that up and then we look for ideas to solve it then only we take up that problem for research, okay? So you have to have a problem in mind. So when you start doing research, that's why it's chapter one, you will have research problem there, right? Problem statement. And then at the end of your research, people would like to see whether you have the answers or solutions to the problem. There are many other definitions are there, but I always call it a PhD is a journey. And I have taken a project now, I'm writing a book, huh? I'm writing a book, the PhD journey, a book, I think it's going to be about two to three hundred pages. That's where you will get everything. How to write chapter one, how to write chapter two, how to write chapter three, four, five. And even including in chapter one, how to write research problem and all that. Everything would be there. It's just going to be a pocket book. A pocket book for PhD students. That's, that's what I plan. And I, I'm hoping, inshallah, by next year, mid next year. So from now, another year the book should be available for PhD students, all right? So this is how it is. PhD is challenge after challenge. Some challenges could be easier, but some could be harder. But you will face up with challenges always. If you don't face any challenges, then you are not doing a real PhD. And you will only believe me this statement that once you complete the PhD, you may not be able to get a good job. And even you get a job, you will not be promoted. If you are not doing a good PhD, if you are doing a PhD, having a lot of challenges, going through challenges, overcoming it, you will enjoy and love to get the certificate. And after that, when you 
get into a job, look for a job, you get job easily. And when you get into a job, the most important way are when you are, whether you are getting promoted, you know, you're having uh, career growth and advancement with a PhD degree. That's more important than after the degree, okay? So this is what you want. Huh? We, we, we basically, with a PhD degree, we'd like to fill up the gap, we'd like to solve the problem. We have to provide solutions to fill up the gap that we have, right? So that's what is PhD talk about. Right? Let me start today's topic. The first barrier or the first challenge. First challenge is definitely finding the right topic. Finding a right topic for your PhD, all right? But remember, everything starts with an idea. When you see a problem, then you look for solutions. You have a number of ideas. But not all ideas could be feasible, suitable. Not, idea, not ideas can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, appropriate to be a solution to the problem that you have. So what you need to do, you got to transform the idea into a researchable topic. That's the first challenge that you have. So when you have the ideas, from ideas, you slowly move into developing concept. From the concept, you move into construct and proposition and theory. That's how a research is completed, OK? So your research starts with ideas. And slowly, you will develop concept. From there, you develop construct, meaning measurable items to uh, 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 measure, right? To, to measure the concept. And then we, we, we assume relationship, and finally, we come out with the theory. Now, let me cover this one a bit, bit more, because uh, those of you are beginner, that's where you'll be having trouble. The constructive approach to choose a topic, right? That, that's the first uh, problem that you have, finding out the right topic. Uh, yesterday, a brother from Tanzania contacted me. He said that he is uh, in the midway of doing his PhD uh, research. And he still is having problem with the title. So he has shared the title with me and asked me whether I can help him to find tune. Okay, so I did, I did. And this is also, I have written a paper and submitted for publication, uh, similar title, huh? a constructive approach to choose a researchable topic. I've written a paper on it and submitted to a journal. You will get the paper published soon, hopefully, okay? So when you are talking about or thinking of Selecting a topic for PhD, the first point that you got to look at is your interests. Huh? What interests you? Uh, if you are having a background in management and you are going for a finance topic for PhD, of course, the university will not accept you. But even they accept you, you won't be able to do it. Huh? Sometime, even when you have done your degree in certain area, uh, because you did it, because you got no choice. But after that, when you come to master's PhD, you may not get any more interest in that area so you would like to explore into some other areas but definitely has to be relevant related to the first degree that we have but now with the technological advancement with ir 4.0 everything is technology driven so any phd topic that you would like to undertake definitely some kind of technological inclination you know it has to be there technological application has to be there in the topic, be it management, marketing, finance, accounting, or whatever, technological part has to be now embedded in the research topic. Otherwise, your PhD topic could be just outdated and uh, may not be useful at all. Okay. So the first one definitely your interest. So that makes you feel like you know once you are interested, feel like interested on the topic, it, it will be easy for you to find the topic and later your life would be easier because you feel motivated, you feel inspired. You know, it gives you inner, inner satisfaction of doing something because you are interested in it. So that's the first one. The next one will be looking at availability of resources. Many students will come out with topic and then after three months, six months, they will start complaining. I cannot find literature. I cannot find literature. <laughs> and that's why we say when you propose a topic, make sure the topic is even though you are interested in it, but you got to have available enough adequate resources because that resources help you to define your problem. And then that, that, that resources also help you to identify the right kind of theories that may explain the phenomenon that you have, the theory that may help you to construct the theoretical framework. And later you collect data and finally you come out with the conclusion, right? The solution to the problem they have identified. So this is important, uh, very important, right? Uh, 
uh, you have to, before you start PhD, before you finalize the topic, make sure you have enough resources available. And now everything is on fingertips. So, so you just go to Google and find out whether you have a lot of papers available there. Okay. What is the current state of research or discussion in the field? Okay. So you are looking at the current status of research in that area, the area that you are now talking about, right? Uh, if you choose an area which have been exhaustively, uh, you know, uh, research has been uh, done and the field has got like dried up, exhausted, and uh, you want to do a new research, then later you will suffer. Even though you have a lot of resources available for you, but you will struggle. You will find it very hard to find something new. Because in a PhD research, at the end of the day, you have to contribute new knowledge. And that's where you will have serious problems. So you have to look at the current state of research. Okay, Certain areas are very dry. Thousands of research have been done. And it's very difficult to contribute something new. All right? So that's something very important for you to understand. That, that you know, uh, somehow triggers the next one. How would undertaking this research contribute to the knowledge in the field? And trust me, when you go for the final viva, you will switch to answer this question. This is the question that makes every PhD students suffer during the final viva versus session. What is your new knowledge contribution? Huh? We look at three areas of contributions. I will later talk about it. But knowledge contribution is the main point that you look at for PhD degree. And that's the difference between master and PhD degree. In master degree, we do not look at new knowledge contribution, but PhD contribution, new knowledge contribution is the main criteria to give you the degree. Okay. So you have to look at whether you have enough space, scope for you to contribute new knowledge. All right. A topic that you are inquisitive about and something that you feel like hey, something I feel something happening there and some some kind of solution needed and you feel like something must be done you know that can, kind of topic that kind of topic so it will be like developing inquisitive mind of asking and asking more and uh, getting more interested and getting more eager to know you know so that kind of topic would be good for you what is the significance of the topic whether it is going to contribute not only to the body of knowledge you have to look at also industrial implications. Now, uh, now, most of the universities in the world, even though PhD and academic degree, we say there must be new knowledge contribution, but now we also look at whether, whether your PhD contributes to the industry. So some kind of industrial contribution, uh, some kind of policy recommendations, all that got to be there. So you got to look at the topic and see whether that topic somehow related to the industry. That topic has some kind of application in the industry. That is also very important for you before you finally decide. A topic that is thought provoking, uh, the, the topic that, that somehow uh, very demanding now. For example, like if you're doing in finance, definitely FinTech, you know, uh, if, 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 if you're talking about business law, business analytics, uh, internet of things, uh, you know, uh, there, there are many new areas uh, are, are coming in the business uh, field, uh, which which are very important for us to look into. All right, so something that that provoke you, something you know that that provoke you to think more and more to find solutions. In PhD is not something very easy, right? I started with that. Something very very uh, demanding, and um, we have to propose something new to the society, to the world. That is PhD, right? And then you have to see whether it is practical or doable. Sometimes uh, some students will come to see us and uh, the topic is such that uh, it's not possible to do within three years time, right? Usually PhD takes about three years. Certain country like US, it is four years, but most of the countries like it is basically three years. And uh, on average, the student will take about three to five years to complete PhD. So when you are thinking of a topic, the number of things that you look at earlier point that I mentioned, Together with that, also you have to look at the time frame that is given whether you can finish within that time. You have to look at the financial resources. If, if certain kind of study require a lot of funding, whether you will have enough funding of that. The number three, also look at your strength. If you're choosing a topic that requires very advanced level software, so you have to look at yourself whether you would be 
able to cope with that kind of advanced softwares available. All right. So now uh, many of us we use uh, R, you know, the Python uh, machine learning, uh, those, those kind of software already there we use in research. So so the days of like you know um, Minitab uh, SAS is over. We used to use SPSS. Now we move from SPSS to Amos and Sam, you know, uh, Stata, all that, and then. We, we have now in vivo and Atlas T for qualitative research. And now we are even moving more on advanced research topics with advanced software. R, R is one, Python is one, uh, machine learning is another, and you may have more to, to, to come, okay? So you have to look at whether it is practical for you and doable for you, something realistic for you to do. So you have to look at your own strength, all right? And see how complete the study and how would you be able to cope with the study. Avoid popular topics. This is basically, we call it reinventing the wheel. <laughs> you see, thousands of people are doing it and you're also doing the same. Eh? While we say that you make sure that enough resources are there, you have enough literature available, it doesn't mean that you have to choose a topic that is being done worldwide so much that a lot of literature available. So you said, okay, a lot of sources are available, so I go for it. It's not like that. When you find a topic is very popular, it doesn't mean that that, 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 that that's the research you should be doing, okay? Because it could be that you have abundance of information, but maybe you will have difficulty finding out anything new. Everything is done. Or maybe those people, uh, hundreds and thousands of people are doing research, and when you finish, before you finish, they will be finishing their research, and you will be like ending up with nothing new, all right? So that's what you got to look at. So finally, I'm saying that one must make sure that you have narrowed down your topic several times before you choose the final topic. That's why I say that is very important. You narrow down and narrow down. PhD is done on a very specific niche area. You identify a research gap, define research problem from there. It's a very narrow down topic, okay? very narrow down topic. You'll be making many changes during uh, this time and you can always consult with the supervisor colleagues or any you know industry experts uh, uh, to make sure that you, you are at the right topic uh, and and you are suitable uh, based on your inner strain that you have okay so this is how we operationalize right we we start with construct and uh, finally we down into uh, uh, elements which i'm not going to look at these are the some of the uh, areas you look at when you collect information right information will come from your intuition first then you experience, do some research, and consult with people with authority, right? You know that. So this could be uh, uh, the four stages which will help you to convert ideas to a researchable topic, all right? So that is the first challenge that I talk about. Uh, the first challenge or first barrier is finding out the right kind of topic, a doable research topic, a researchable topic, all right? So that's the first challenge. The second one, getting started. Now we have a dream, you want to do PhD, and then where to start, <laughs> okay? You start talking to people, you start uh, browsing here, there, you, you look for information, and then you find out um, a good research problem uh, that, that you, you feel that is, is, is something good to take on for PhD study. Then you find university, and then you got a supervisor, you got enrolled. And now how to get started? Okay, so, so so basically this is what is uh, when you start thinking like oh there are so many you know things there so why they ask you read books like go back and read articles and come back to me you talk to your colleague they say go back read papers read papers everybody will be talking about it huh? even if you come to see me I say read read and read that is PhD the more you read the more you you know become proficient in the area so there's no other alternative than reading you have to read you have to read okay. But this is even more important, right? Uh, most of us will be in the comfort zone. And we feel like uh, I want to complete the PhD with that, living in that zone. You will never be able to complete PhD. You will never be able. You have to challenge yourself and you have to break that barrier, the comfort zone, and you have to go to the next zone. We call it fear zone, huh? fear zone. You will be like afraid, you know, you are not having enough confidence whether you can really do it. And you see what people are doing and uh, they are commenting on you and all that. You know, when I started in PhD, every time I go back home, uh, relatives will come here, what, what are you doing? Uh, uh, 
what is the progress? Uh, how come it's only three years you haven't completed? You know, people will start talking and all that. So, so, so that's the fear zone you are living, you know. And once you cross the fear zone, you will be moving into the learning zone. All right. So you'll be dealing with the challenge. You don't mind. You are now developed self-confidence. You put a lot of hard work and now you know exactly how to solve the problems. Uh, so you just expect, you just see any problem comes in, you just cross the bridge. Okay, that's how it is. So you are gaining new knowledge experience, you are expanding your comfort zone. And then only when you, you know, cross the learning zone, you will go into the growth zones. That's where you will be just comfortable and you are there. And you will be, you'll be just enjoying uh, doing your work. Okay, so that's how it is. Uh, you cannot be living in the comfort zone. Uh, it's like you are waking up in the morning, having a good breakfast. You are living a lazy life, you know, 10 o'clock, you go to the university and then you two, two hours talk to the friends and, you know, have your lunch and go back to the PhD study room and talk to your friends and look at the WhatsApp, Facebook, all that. At night, again, you spend it. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I always tell PhD students, if you can guarantee me, you will spend four to six hours per day, four to six hours per day, quality spending time i will guarantee you you'll finish phd within three years four to six hours enough but it has to be very focused to it you are not you handphone is like for myself even when i take handphone in the office you know i'll just put aside i'll put a silence mode when i work when i'm working on a paper on a book i'm writing book or papers i'm looking at you know a student thesis as examiner or as a supervisor i will just put handphone in one side i'll not receive any call it's silence mode because I am now there, you know, my job, first job is to consider on my things. So, so many times I will tell PhD students, while you are doing PhD journey, you are in the PhD journey, deactivate your Facebook account. That's what I always say. <laughs> you may not agree with me. I prefer that. I prefer not to have the Facebook at all during the PhD journey. Just concentrate in your PhD. That's better. Huh? One of my own PhD students, my analysis is, he's a very intelligent student. He could have completed PhD within three years, but it took him five years. It's just because he was too active in Facebook. We just waste time. The social media is wasting of time most of the time. You will just open your hand, pin, click, you know, there is a WhatsApp. Okay, then you feel like, well, let me go to the Facebook, what happened? And then you go there, you spend one hour, one hour, half an hour, two hours. You do not know that one hour is gone, okay? So do not live in a comfort zone. Huh? You cannot be living in a comfort zone. You have to understand PhD is not something easy. It's difficult. It's difficult. Uh, is it going to be permanent health damage? You know, permanent head damage? Or you want to be happy, having a permanent happiness degree? It's up to you, all right? So you have to work hard to get something better. That's life, okay? So what do you start? The starting is first barrier. Break the first barrier. Leaving your comfort zone, okay? And then you get papers okay when you confirm a topic then you have your research uh, parameters there see for example you are doing a study on job satisfaction the parameters would be like uh, leadership style working environment employee, -employee relationship so those are the parameters you you type it in google and look for papers and you do uh, you know obtain literature evaluate it then you start writing and then you start drawing the review work right drafting the review you start writing from the very beginning when you reach the first paper this is from Saunders at all, business research method. And that process continues, meaning that you have to obtain the relevant literature, related literature. You review it, you start writing it. So that's how you would be starting. So that's the second challenge. The first challenge is to find out the right topic. The second challenge is getting started. All right. I said you have to break down the barrier of comfort zone. Leave the comfort zone. Leave the comfort zone. Challenge yourself for something harder. Okay, something harder. And then you will obtain literature, read, read, and read. There's no other choice. Huh? I remember the first time when I started reading papers after reading a few lines, I feel like I want to run away. <laughs> and when I finish reading one paper, I go to the next one. I cannot remember what I read in the first one. It's very common. Don't worry. Everybody goes through the same. But as you read more and more, you will feel comfortable and you will start getting, you know, understanding and control over the research area that you have chosen for your research, all right? Now, the third challenge of, of course, uh, reading papers, as I said, even myself, after reading a few lines, I want to run away, right? Uh, this is very common. 
Um, if you have not read research papers before, many of most of the honors and undergrad and master's program doesn't have research. And you are not being forced to read research papers. You are not taught how to read research papers. So then that's, that's where you will have the third challenge. How to read a research paper? A research paper could be 10 pages long, could be 15 pages long, could be 40 pages long, could be 50 pages long. How do I read? Remember, in a research paper, not everything is important for you. Not everything is important for you. Okay. So you have to learn how to get important things, how to extract the important things. Huh? And this is what Harvard College Library um, recommends that a paper should be read, uh, read by four times. Okay, four times. So first reading you preview so you read for the sake of reading second reading you underline that you feel that these are the part i would like to take and the third reading you summarize okay i'm going to give you a, a template afterwards and many of you are familiar with my template how to summarize research space in a single page i'm going to show you afterwards and when you read more than one then you start comparing and contrasting that is also i'll tell you how to do that so once you obtain, once definitely difficult to find a paper, but once you obtain paper, then reading paper even more difficult, okay? And Harvard College Library is recommending that you should be reading a paper for four times, okay? Now, the next challenge, how to extract relevant information, right? You are reading now, and I told you that you are annotating, you are summarizing, you're comparing, contrasting. So you have done that. Now, how do you extract those information and put it somewhere? And you can remember those extracted information. That is challenge number four, okay? Uh, this time, you would be like that. Huh? You would be like that. Uh, so much thing. And how do I remember? You read one paper, and you go to read the second one. You cannot remember the first one. And you read the third one. The, you cannot remember the first two. And we go to the tenth one. You do not know exactly what is happening. Hey, I cannot remember anything, you know. <laughs> but there are ways that helps you to remember what you read, all right? So this is something that I have proposed to the world of research. And this is um, already copyrighted in Malaysia, huh? already copyrighted. This is a template that I developed. In the middle, I put the title of the paper. So I said, when you read a paper, see what the research problem was, you know, what research problem they under, you know, they, they, they identified and tried to solve. So that one, you put in few sentences in research problem. Then when you read literature review, find out what other theories they use what are the theories underpin or support their development of a framework and hypothesis all right and then you look at how did they collect the data how did they analyze the data and what were the findings okay what are the findings okay so that's what we will take it in okay what are the findings you know so you take note and finally you also take note from the paper at the end every paper will have the suggestion for future research when you do research, at the end, you will realize that you, your research do have a lot of limitations. So what you do to overcome that, you will say that, okay, I have certain limitations to overcome that. The future researchers should be considering this. So from there, you can pick up something new. And that's a very important thing. I will tell you later again uh, why it is so important. All right. So you can see here a paper be summarized into one a single page. Okay. And, and as you go, this is another paper, and this is another paper, and it goes on. So if you do like that, what I advocate, uh, my PhD students will do it. When you finish reading 10 papers and you have 10 pages of summary like this, then I will ask them to convert the 10 page into one single page. So now 10 page, 10 research papers being summarized into one single page. And that's how we remember, okay? That's how we remember. Remember, when you go for final viva bose, or you remember you, when you go for proposal defense, uh, pre-viva, certain universities, they have pre-viva, and the final viva, you're supposed to have the current key papers and the current research papers in your lips. Anything they question you, you can cite the name and you can tell exactly what did they do and what did they find out. So how do you remember all that? Definitely mind mapping kind of thing helps you a lot, okay? This is not exactly a mind map thing, but it's a template that may help you. But I would prefer even more if you learn how to do the mind mapping. A paper can be mind mapped into one single page. 
and only finish 10 papers, 10 papers, mind map, bring it into one single page. Can be done. It's doable, all right? And what I do with my PhD students, once they do read 10 papers, they will summarize in the single page, they will come and debate with me. Then I will ask them to train, read another 10, they bring another paper like this, and they go for four cycles, 10, 10, 10, 10, 40 papers. Once they finish reading 40 papers, they have four single page, then I will ask them to merge the four single page into one single page. Four pages into one single page. So that single page is the summary of 40 research papers. It is doable. If you can do that, if you can do that, even in the mind mapping, you will be like surprised to see, you know, the thing that you have done it. You would be surprised to see that all information from 40 papers are in a single page. And that's what helps you to be confident. And when you go to the defense, you have all the citations and the 40 papers that you read from her, you can tell exactly what is there, you know, and that's how you identify the gap. How did you go through your research and how did you collect the data? What uh, the previous research is, how did they collect the data? How did you analyze your research data? And what the previous researchers did, you know, all sort of things will be just in your mind and you'll find your life is easy. You are getting control over it, all right? So if you are able to do it, so I see that's what it is, okay? <laughs> the fourth challenge. Identification and definition of research problem. I didn't put it at the beginning, yeah? Because research problem uh, you have in mind, but it will be properly identified and defined through the literature review. As you read through papers, you will find team. Remember, you may have some absurd idea, some shallow ideas, and slowly you will start fine tuning, fine tuning, and narrow down and come to a researchable topic, okay? So this is, um, Finding out problem, where do I find the problem? And many students will ask these questions. And when you go for the final Viva Bosia proposal defense, the examiners will be asking you the questions, hey, what are the issues? Tell me what are the issues? <laughs> and the students will be always having difficulty in all that. And uh, if you want to identify this is problem, uh, these are the areas where you can uh, easily identify actually uh, uh, this problem, uh, consulting with the experts, your personal experiences, practical experiences, critical review of literature, looking at the folklore of the country, brainstorming, previous research, existing theories, social issues, exposed to field, you know, all those sort of things are there, which may help you to find out definitely some problem that is accessible. The problem that's affecting society and needs solution need, okay? So research problem may come from three, and these three are actually the area where you contribute. The knowledge gap, once you identify, you can fill in, that gives you the PhD. And then we are saying that knowledge gap is not enough. Now we need to have industrial you know, contribution. So when you have gap identified from literature, a knowledge gap been identified, it's supposed to be you know, backed up uh, with uh, industrial evidence and data. That's what we recommend now, okay? And then you, will, you can we may even look at uh, some methodological issues. There could be some methodological issues and uh, some problems are there and it may propose something new and that might also give you a PhD degree, all right? So this is how uh, the knowledge or theoretical gap uh, can be identified. You look at existing established theories, uh, you can verify theory, you can nullify theory, you can modify theory, you can extend a theory, you can integrate free theories, you can validate theory. You know, these all sort of things are there that considered to be knowledge gaps and also considered to be your new knowledge contribution later, all right? And it could be, have, may have methodological issues also there, okay? So this is something that I propose, and uh, I have also uh, uh, copyrighted this in Malaysia with my IPO, okay? So I have given you a template like this, main problem you have at the top, and then identify issues one by one, and all issues become your independent variable, all right? So this is basically knowledge gap, and that is through the literature review and some evidence and data from industry together, okay? That's how you can put the research problem into a template. And this is about the industrial issues, you see. So you have knowledge issues, and then you have industrial issues. And that's what I call it a research problem. Huh? If you say you have identified a research problem through literature, then I would say there is a literature gap. There is a knowledge gap. There is not a research problem yet. A research knowledge gap, theoretical gap, can be converted into a research problem when it is supported by some industrial data and evidence, okay? 
All right, the next one, the challenge number six, data collection. Now this become, I think the most difficult part now, huh? collecting data. When you choose the people in you know, the sample and sampling method, and then you start data collection. To, to, to share with you my PhD degree, uh, our time, internet was not there yet. Uh, Internet was there, but uh, the data, uh, like data stream and all those not available yet. So my dear, my PhD was in finance and I was looking at earning management. So I have to get, uh, uh, how many hundreds I forgot already, it's been already 12 years. <laughs> I think about 112 for a company and I have to get three years annual report. So 336 annual report. Huh? I have to photocopy practically. I have to photocopy the annual report, 336 book to be photocopied. You know, that was like heavy, huge number, huge number. To big pack, you know, somebody, a friend of mine photocopied it for a few months, then brought it to Malaysia for my country. When I have, you know, obtained that, the annual reports, then to extract data and key in in Excel, it took me nine months, not me alone, together with six or seven of my students and few colleagues, two or three colleagues together, like almost 10 of us work on extracting data keen in Excel. It took us nine months for the data collection. That's that kind of hard work we had to do. But now uh, if you are doing on uh, secondary data is available most of the time. It is primary data also very difficult questionnaire. Not many people will fill in questionnaire really with good intention and uh, uh, sincerity, okay? So you give them the question, you will find out when you collected bad all, everyone is strongly agree, strongly agree, strongly agree. Or everyone, uh, some people will start with one and uh, it's ended up on like one, you know, some you start with three, ended up with three, you start with four, end up with four. So you know that they are not sincere. So one is getting sincere, right, honest feedback. And the other one, even getting access to the premise and getting the data, all right? So what do you do now? We can use monkey, survey monkey. You can use Google form, but the response rate is very poor. Uh, one of my students was doing PhD here at the University of Malaysia Police. He was, uh, he was having very difficult time collecting data. First, he emailed Google form to 200 people. And after three weeks, he did not get back even one, uh, not even one. And he reminded three times, not even one. Uh, can, you can imagine. So what can he do? You know, what can he do? So he had to finally appoint a research assistant and paid him. And then he went around, uh, you know, look around people and getting the question of feeling. So this is challenge number six, getting the right kind of data. Remember, if you fail to write kind of data, your solution out bound to be wrong, right? If a doctor is treating you and he doesn't diagnose your problem, the data that you give him is wrong. Of course, he is not going to prescribe you the wrong medicine. Okay, so the output is going to be bad. So data quality is very important. Data quality very important. So when you collect the data, you key in, and you start running uh, all that, then you'll find the quality is very bad. That's it. You'll be having hell of your life, you know, with analysis and all that. Challenge number seven: data analysis. This one I have to talk a bit. Um, when you enroll into a PhD program, please, please make sure you learn the software that you are going to use. If you are going to use PLS, please attend workshops and learn it. There's so many uh, tutorials available in YouTube. Learn it. If you are quantitative, doing qualitative research in Vivo at last, you learn one. If you are going to use AMOS, please learn. If you are using panel data analysis by Stata, learn Stata. The software that you are going to uh, use your data analysis, make sure you learn it. Please learn it. Do not outsource it. It is allowed. You can outsource it. Somebody can run the analysis. May even write the chapter four for you. Nobody will know. And he will train you and tell you this means what and all that and you can defend. But what happened after PhD? If you want to supervise a student, you are not going to be a good supervisor. You want to write a paper, every time you have to outsource it, you know, 
every time you have to beg people to run the data and give you an interpretation and all that please this is a must learn the software that is essential to analyze the data that you have collected for your phd all right so that is challenge number seven and that has to be that has to be taken very seriously okay even for my student PhD, i used to tell them it's okay you can outsource the data analysis but now i tell everyone no you must learn the software i see many examiners coming in the final viva versus session they have a lot of questions on chapter one two three when come to chapter four many of them will say this chapter i'm sorry i'm not good in this good in the software so i don't have any question then i will tell the person then you should not have been the internal external examiner then or internal examiner phd is given based on chapter four and five not chapter one three chapter one two three all you have collected from people previous researches but chapter four five is your own chapters that gives you the phd so the internal external examiner should be very proficient on data analysis, the robustness of data analysis and all the matters employed. Otherwise, the person should not be an examiner for you. And that's what is going to happen to you. If you're not learning the software now, when you complete the PhD, become supervisor examiner, that's the lousy job that you are going to do. You know, you will tell, I'm sorry, I'm not good in that software, so I'm not going to ask you any questions in chapter four. That is not right, okay? Because the PhD is given based on chapter four or five. If you cannot say anything on chapter four, then it shouldn't be an examiner. And when you supervise, a student come and see you, you cannot guide a student. You cannot tell students, okay, this means what, this means what, you know, all that, you cannot. So you have to tell students, okay, I'm sorry, I cannot help you on chapter four, you find I'm sourcing and all that. That is not right. As a supervisor, you should be able to know exactly the, the, the software that the students are using, okay? And I have, Caught students for cheating many, many huh? data manipulation, data massaging, very common. Okay, so even some students will not distribute question and they will create their data. And remember, my brothers and sisters, those of uh, those of you are with me, I have seen students given the data to somebody outside to do the analysis and write up chapter four. Later. When I got hold of the original data, took back from him and I ran, I see it's completely different. Why? Because those people are doing the outsourcing job. They will have a set of data. What they will do, they will just change the name of the variable. They will not use your data, my brothers, sisters. They have the standard data they will use and run it and give it to you, the output. Do you want that? Definitely not. See, if you don't want that, then you have to put effort to learn the software okay so that is challenge number seven challenge number eight the contribution huh? that the, the, the one earlier i was talking about uh, when it comes to phd that's the question that we all get uh, sweet huh? <laughs> we will we'll be, we'll be having perspiring during the session <coughs> answering the question what is your contribution PhD is given for either new knowledge contribution, it has to be there, combined with industrial contribution or methodological contribution. That gives you the PhD. All right. And, and when you go to the final Viva versus session or proposal differentiation, that's what you will see the examiners will be like, they want that and they want that, they want many things. They want like in one tree, they want apple and uh, banana and uh, lemon and uh, oranges and all that. Definitely that is not. That is not expected. So, what do we expect then? We earlier I have shown you the template on the knowledge contribution. There are many areas you can verify a theory, you can nullify a theory, you can extend a theory, you can modify a theory, you can integrate theories, you can test effectiveness of theory, you can validate a theory, verify a theory. Right? There are many ways there you can you can contribute a new knowledge. So when you are having a tree. And it is an orange tree, say for example, and if I, if I is still planting the orange tree, then what would be contribution? People say, okay, there's so many orange trees. If your orange tree give you more oranges, that is contribution. The size of the orange is bigger, that is contribution. The taste of this orange is much better than others, that is contribution. It's more nutritious, so also a contribution. That's what you are looking at. We are not asking you to produce apple in the orange tree. We are not asking you to produce banana in the orange tree, right? So that's what I said. 
theory, modification, verification, extension, all sort of things. That's what we want. Something little bit of something new in the knowledge, in the form of knowledge. So you, it is a new moderating variable. It is new mediating variable. In the independent variable, there are four or five. We introduce a new one from the literature. So that's what we expect from you. Not a lot, not everything new and totally different from others. Okay. And you can have some industrial contribution, new policy being recommended. Or the policies are there, but policies are not implemented. How can the policies be implemented effectively? So you have some guidelines and all that from a research. That is also considered contributions. Okay. For social science research, challenge number nine. When we say new knowledge, remember, we say everything should be supported by literature. Everything should be supported by literature. Then how can I find something new? <laughs> okay. How can you find something new? That was my question. You know, when I was doing my PhD and uh, proposal defense time examiners, he started drilling me and say, hey, everything you say must be having uh, literature support. Then I said, then how can I have something new? And my examiners didn't have any answers, you know. So when I completed PhD, start supervising my student, then I got a clue where to find something new. When you read research papers, make sure as a PhD student, you read the last section of the paper, suggestion for future research. They will say, the future researchers may embark on this topic. They may introduce a new variable like that. They may introduce this variable as mediating. They may introduce this variable as moderating. You know, that is not being tested by anyone. But you have a citation. Somebody has recommended. Somebody suggested. That is also a citation. All right. So when you summarize paper, the, 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 the template that I've given you, you can see here, suggestion for future research. The lot you will find. So those may not be available in the literature but available in the form of published paper is still considered literature for you so you have established four independent variables and you pick up one from suggestion for future research you pick up two from suggestion for future research those going to be completely new contribution for you okay so that is challenge number nine challenge number ten very delicate one your relationship with supervisors Remember, supervisor is the one who will give you the degree. Please keep that in mind. Who give you the who gives you the PhD degree? Your supervisor, not the university, not the examiners, your supervisor. Please bear that in mind. It is the supervisors who will propose your internal and external examiners. It is the supervisors who will defend you in case you have trouble, difficulty during proposal defense final viva. It is your supervisors who will help you doing all the correction that you have after final viva if you have a lot and convincing the externals. And it is your supervisor who will finally sign the hard copy with you. Every PhD thesis is signed by whom? The student and supervisor. It's the supervisor because the supervisor is giving the degree. When you attend a viva session, Please take this point. Take note of this point. Sometimes examiners could be a very different one. You know, and they, they, they talk a lot of things and they give you a lot of suggestions and you find that some suggestions are not really worthy at all. Some suggestions could be even lousy. And still you cannot say it's wrong to the supervisor, to the examiners. What do you do? It's all right. I'm taking note. I'll talk to my supervisors, okay? So you talk to your supervisor. You finally decide because who is going to finally sign your thesis? Your supervisor, not the examiners. Not your dean, not the VC, not the university register. It is a supervisor and you who is going to finally sign your thesis for the submission. So you have to have very good relationship with your supervisor. If you find somehow you are not compatible. You cannot cope with the supervisor demand and all that. Change the supervisor from the very beginning. Do not wait for too long. 
do not wait for too long. Every faculty, every university have the process of changing supervisors. You have to tell supervisors, I'm sorry, I cannot cope with your style. I had a PhD student who was working with the supervisor and then somehow he couldn't cope. He came and told me that, Prof, I cannot really uh, work with him. I said, I cannot tell you anything. You have to deal with the faculty. So go and see the dean and follow the process. So once I'm appointed, I will talk to you, not before that, because I cannot have a conflict with my colleagues, right? So the student deal, and then finally he came to see me, and then he did his PhD. But then the student completed PhD in one year and nine months eh, from Nigeria. But he cannot submit PhD before two years, right? So he, he completed everything in one year and nine months. I said, okay, now we read, uh, write papers. Eh? And together we have written, I think, about 11 Scopus papers that, that, that my student from Nigeria, okay? So your relationship with supervisors are very important. Huh? And that's what is being said. The unwritten rule for PhD research, we say the relationship between supervisor and student is about as close as many marriages and last as long as many marriages, okay? <laughs> it's like, you know, that's, that's the unwritten rule. We call it marriage of convenience, huh? marriage of convenience. Your relationship is that close, you know, you'll be arguing, you'll be, uh, you know, having ups and downs of relationship and all that. It goes on with the supervisor, okay? So that's what I said earlier. The one important issue is definitely compatibility. From the beginning, you look at your supervisor, talk to him and see he, what he expects from you and what kind of style he has. If you can cope with him, keep him with you. If you feel that, no, you are not going to go with him, change the supervisor early. Do not wait and waste one, two years. I know many students who have started doing PhD with certain supervisors and then couldn't cope. And after one and a half years or one year, they want to change the supervisor. It became very difficult, but they changed already one and a half years. Wasted, you know, because why? When they are given a new supervisor, the new supervisor said, I do not agree with this topic. You have to change the topic. And... You know, choose something that is I like. So you have wasted your one and a half years. Why should you be doing that? So when you find a supervisor, talk to him, hard to hard talk, you know. And sometimes uh, do not only have meetings in the office. Sometimes you go for a coffee, a tea, you know, sometimes lunch or dinner together with the supervisors. Have, you know, friendly talks and hard to hard talks and all that. Make sure, you know, uh, you get a, a, a somehow working relationship with the supervisors. But again, uh, you got to be careful also. Huh? We know many cases whereby supervisor fall in love with the student and uh, there are many broken families are there because of PhD, the affairs between supervisors and the students. And that had to be uh, very careful of. Huh? So we, we, we have to understand, uh, you know, the, 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 the line, the line that you have to draw a line. You cannot cross that line. Uh, so supervisors got to be careful. The students also got to be careful that you do not have that kind of situations. Uh, between supervisors and students, okay? So that's why I say it is a very delicate uh, 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 challenge uh, that, that every, every, every PhD student will face and somehow you have to manage it. If you fail to manage, you'll be dropping out from the program. You will quit PhD just because you couldn't cope with the supervisors, okay? I'm, I'm getting a student now. Uh, he's originally from uh, India and he's working now in Oman. Uh, he told me that, Prof, I enroll into a PhD program and after two and a half years, I have to abandon. So he wasted his two and a half years. And then he was looking for somebody really he can work in, with. And so somehow he feel like getting the feedback from my students who graduated for, uh, under my supervision. Uh, he wanted me, so he got me. So he's very happy now. He said, I would like to complete within two years. So, so he's working very hard. So he wasted two and a half years because he couldn't cope with the supervisors, okay? So the two and a half years for his life is wasted just because he couldn't cope. Huh? So he has to quit. And he has to find another university, another supervisor to do a new PhD. And finally, uh, not finally, challenge number 11, the mental and physical health, huh? mental, physical health. Um, many PhD students will get into uh, serious sickness. Huh? Uh, during the PhD journey, getting gastritis, blood pressure, blood sugar is normal, very normal now. Huh? Even myself, I fall in sick eh? because I was working and doing part-time PhD. I fall in sick with some stomach issues because I was skipping meals and not having right timing of meals and all that. Then when I became sick, I went to hospital and I was hospitalized. I went to hospital and the doctor said, 
you have to choose one, either work or do PhD. You cannot keep both together because I was working in the private in colleges, okay? So I came back home, I talked to my wife, we discussed, and finally we decided I would quit the job and, and do PhD full time. That's what I did, you know? So, but the, the, the physical problem that I got during the PhD journey, I'm still keeping that with me, you know? I still live very disciplined life. So if, it, if, if I have a little bit of uh, indiscipline in food taking, in sleeping and all that, I will have stomach issues, okay? So when you enroll for PhD, this one you have to keep in mind. Because it requires a lot of mental and physical strength to complete PhD, a lot, okay? So certain practices are very important. For example, like after 5 or 5.30 in the evening, you should not be doing any work. You should be going to the field, play games that you like, be football, basketball, or whatever. Or if you do not know any specific games how to play, then just go for running and jogging. Do that every day. Do that every day. You work since morning until 5 o'clock, 5.30, just go out to the field. Sometime lie down on the grass and just grass and look, look at the sky, you know. Enjoy looking at the creatures of God. Look at the creature, you know, the greeneries, the trees, uh, the skies and all that, you know. So you, you have to have that. Socializing with people, talking, uh, telling stories, you know, uh, that's what is needed. Um, and also now, uh, if you really want to be strong in terms of mentally and physically, uh, definitely you have to get rid of the handphone. Huh? Do, do not reuse too frequently the handphone. Uh, that may not be very good for you in the mental and physical health as well as is going to be detrimental for your PhD journey. All right. The many research is being done, which I'm not going to uh, read for you. Okay, I'm not going to read. Uh, it says uh, uh, basically this research conducted. It said 50 uh, percent, 29 percent. Another study says 71 percent or 36 percent. They they say they are in anxiety and stress. And uh, at the end, this paper says even. There are universities where students requested the university to introduce a room, they call it crying room, a crying room. If the students want to have a room where they can go and cry, <laughs> a crying room. So that's how serious many of my friends uh, have serious mental disorder. They were hospitalized, they have been treated, and they have been with it for long. I know a lady who, uh, after PhD, she was traumatized uh, so much that she became psychic. And on three, four years, she was continuously, you know, on and off hospitals. I know one of my friends also, uh, during the viva, it was so, you know, we, sometimes we call it a viva room as a torture chamber, huh? torture chamber. Uh, some, some, some internal could be really that tough. And... Uh, you really couldn't handle them and it, 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 it will affect seriously because you worked like four five years and then you couldn't defend yourself how do you feel you know so that feeling is there so my friend or one of my friend uh, after after doing uh, the final five hours session four or five years he couldn't drive he couldn't drive his car huh? he couldn't his wife used to drive for him that's how traumatized he was uh, during the five hours session all right and that's why from the beginning if you follow the flow i talked about uh, if you take note of all that, uh, I'm very sure uh, your PhD journey would be uh, enjoying uh, 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 something uh, to, to, to embark on, okay? So you like it. And at the end, uh, when you finish the Viva Process session, of course, every PhD student will cry uh, after the final Viva Process session, okay? Either cry of joy or the cries of sorrow. Uh, I hope every one of you joining me, uh, you will cry with joy. And it's a sharing, calling mom and dad, I have done it. I've completed it, okay? So that's the way I would like to see you. And once you complete uh, the PhD, I would like to see you. You're more mentally and physically stronger than before you started your PhD, all right? And the final challenge, I put it as staying humble. I know some of you may find it funny, but to me, it's very important. Huh? <laughs> when a student complete PhD, usually I keep distance from them, you know? If you ask him, hey, what is your name? He will say, Dr. Aminul Islam. I say, your name is not Dr. Aminul Islam. Your name is Aminul Islam, right? Doctor is not your name. <laughs> and, and they will feel like they are somebody now. Uh, with the doctor, you know, with that degree. And they, they feel they are, they are somebody, somebody special. Um, 
people supposed to acknowledge them, so we're supposed to appreciate them. Uh, somebody different in the society, you've got a status now, you know, you're now in a class. It's not like that, huh? my brothers, sisters. PhD is just another degree. It's just another degree. Once you get a PhD, we just certify that now you are a certified researcher. That's it. That's PhD. Nothing more than that. Nothing more than that. So be humble. Be humble. The more, the more knowledgeable you are, the more humble you should be. The more knowledgeable you are, you should be more sharing. You should be more caring. You should be more contributing. All right. You should be more, uh, you know, sacrificing. That's how we would like to see a PhD graduate once you complete the PhD. All right. So that's the 12 uh, challenges uh, or barriers that I have in mind. And uh, I didn't prepare a lot of slides. I thought I would rather get more questions from you and see whether I can respond to those questions. All right. So with that, I would like to uh, pass over the session to uh, uh, Madam Ramani. Uh, can I pass the session to you? Thank you, sir. Congratulations. And that was an awesome presentation. And I think, uh, uh, sir, all of us, when we are going through or doing PhD, these points are necessary, essential for us to remember and to go forward. And I really like each and every um, and they were really practical ones. And I think uh, without saying anything more, I would like to thank you, first of all. And um, I would like to go ahead and ask the participants to raise any kind of questions, doubts, because sir is there and you can, you know, go ahead and ask him. Kind of a question related to those uh, challenges uh, that he has talked about. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, the only challenge, like uh, for a research scholar, is like dealing with the pressure. It comes from the family. It comes from the expectations of the supervisor. So, uh, as a student, you are to you are in a hustle to complete the PhD as soon as possible, which is towards a, I would say a negative thing in the long term, uh, long run for the PhD itself. It will have a impact on your PhD in a negative sense. So what are your insights on that? Uh, of course, uh, the, the most two uh, elements that affects your uh, PhD, keeps you motivated, uh, going, is your family and your supervisor, of course. Uh, uh, I, I think you shouldn't have any problem getting support from the family. Uh, it should be always, uh, family should be always supporting, they should be always there. And supervisors, please keep in mind that supervisor needs PhD graduates. Uh, if you want to apply for promotion, we need PhD graduate. <laughs> okay. Uh, we need papers. Being an academic, we need papers. So when you have PhD student, you do PhD, and then at the end you publish papers that contribute to our academic growth. Okay. Uh, so 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 there's no way that these two groups will be negative in any way. Uh, so it's a matter of you as a student to manage them well. Okay, brother. Prof, Prof. Yes. 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 I yes. have a question, Prof. Uh, you, you talked about uh, uh, data collection, uh, specifically, uh, suppose if you use uh, uh, Google Form and then you get low rate of uh, return, suppose you expected to collect, uh, uh, I mean, to, to, to collect data from 200 uh, 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 participants. And then you ended up, uh, for example, in one of the research area, you got all the, the number correctly, but one of the research area, you got less. For example, you expect 200, then you got 1,800. Uh, uh, now, what can I do? Because I cannot go back again and, 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 and collect data. No, basically, uh, we know uh, there are sample size calculators available Yes. sample size determination tables available we know how much uh, uh, minimum number of questionnaires we take right yeah. minimum uh, minimum so if you need minimum 200 
then you should be distributing minimum 500 lah. That's how it is. In Malaysia, the response rate is about, about close to 30%. So meaning that if I want to, if I distribute 100, I will get 30. See, if I need 300 questionnaire, how many I have to distribute? 3,000, right? Yes. <laughs> 3,000, right? So one, 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 100, I get 30. So 1,000, sorry, 1,000, I will get 300. So I should distribute 1,000. Then only I can get 300. But I should rather distribute a bit more. You distribute, say, 100, 100, you distribute 1,200. So in that case, if you get about 300 plus, it would be just nice, OK? And uh, if you cannot get through Google uh, form or survey monkey, then you have to employ the personal, you know, the research assistant, pay them and let them go and meet people in face to face and uh, get the data collected. And uh, I see in Malaysia, some practices are there. Uh, we'll post the questionnaire sometime. And in the envelope, we put written, uh, the, 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 the written stamp together with a gift. Say, for example, one uh, pen drive. <laughs> okay. So if you if you do like that, uh, people like uh, feel like okay, uh, since he has given me some you know appreciation, I must be filling in. So that can be done. Certain country I know they will even put in the lab certain amount of money. Okay, so people feel like obliged to fill in for you. All right. So uh, when you are distributing, even say for example, a mall intercept strategy, which is very common now, you go to a mall supermarket and let people fill in the questionnaire for you. So you can tell uh, once you fill in, then um, we, we, we would appreciate, we have some appreciation. Once fill in, you just give one is a small uh, say pain, you know, a good pain for them to write or something like that. It works, you know, it works. Some kind of appreciation gift giving to people uh, may help you to get more questionnaire, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. um, thank you. Yes. Um, Yes, Nuradin. Nuradin, I said, okay, you can raise. Uh, before yes, you, I think. Sir. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, mine, mine is like <laughs> evening now. <laughs> <laughs> we are 10 a.m. here yes. in Nigeria, towards 11. Oh. Sir, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm you, in the workshop now see? due to some uh, noisy environment. But my question is that as a PhD student, where all our programs begins online and then the research area should be physical in the laboratory and hence the, there is no good contact between the students and the supervisor how will you develop that relationship online with your supervisor i think we are getting used to online platforms already you are now communicating with me at this moment so you can always have google meet with your supervisor so you have to take the you have to take the step do not expect supervisor to arrange meeting for you you can always take call the supervisor you know whatsapp the supervisor email the supervisor or call the supervisor can we have a google meet so if you have a google meet like that we still face to face so if you have like weekly or bi-monthly meetings with the supervisor definitely will develop some kind of relationship Nora, then as you are talking with me listening you definitely yes. you develop some kind of understanding about me am i right exactly so that's what you can do you can have google meet with the supervisor and you can still even though you're not in physical touch but still you can have the relationship develop Nora, then now hundreds yes. of people are getting married online right you know that <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, they sir. Don't meet physically, and even the marriage marriage ceremony taking over online. One is living in US, one is living in Malaysia. It's happening now, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, sir, second yes. question is that um, the field that I'm enrolling my research is a new research area, and I find it very difficult to get. Uh, Research papers on this mention field. was made so that we need and, gap. Uh, as we need gap to fill, and so far, no any single research that has been completed 100% in the field. In this case, what will I do, sir? 
I wouldn't advise you to take up research in that kind of area. I do think. For PhD learning, I do not think you should be taking research in that kind of topic. You want to do write a paper based on research, you can do it, but for PhD students. If you do not have enough resources, you should not be embarking your thesis on that area. Okay. Brother Yusuf okay. Balajaria. Yusuf you. Balajaria. Yes, you're welcome. I have, Yusuf, uh, can you please unmute your, is your question? Yeah, Yusuf. Are you there, Yusuf Balajaria? Uh, okay, so then I can give the question uh, to be asked by Vijayaga. I think she is also there. Um, yes, yes, yes. 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 Uh, Vinayaga Lakshmi, can you please um, unmute yourself and you can raise the question? Otherwise, she has uh, you know, given it in the chat box. Uh, how to overcome from fear zone? Give some tips. <laughs> Uh, I, I in my slide I have shown you four zones, right? The first zone is comfort zone. So once you leave the comfort zone, you'll be falling in the fear zone. Yes. So meaning that you know some of us we have habit of sleeping after morning, right? After waking up in the morning and, and go for a little bit longer. Like I, I have some PhD students, they wake up at nine o'clock, ten o'clock. I say, no, that is not right. You should be going back going to bed early and waking up early. So if you wake up at early at five or six o'clock and then you start studying, that time the mind works very well. And then you, if you are sleeping until 19 o'clock in the morning, then at night you'll be staying up late. Your mind is not going to work that way. Okay, so, so, so that kind of thing is there. So you have to leave that comfort zone. Then when you go to fair zone, you will find something uneasy. So you stop sitting there, suddenly you stop sleeping in the morning and you feel like, drowsy uh, no, after lunch you feel like sleepy again and all that this i'm just giving a simple example and then some of you do come and enroll for phd uh, after uh, you know after after losing touch on, on, on books for a long time then you come back now reading a paper is like so difficult you know because you have not been reading <laughs> you have not been reading so now you are reading so when you start reading you are in the fear zone already. You don't understand really. Uh, even if you read, you cannot remember. You know, that, that's kind of it. So you have to put more hard work. More hard work. Huh? Sister, yes, Vina, Vinaya Galaxmi, right? Yes. Sir. You have to put more hard work. You have to move, put more hard work. Challenge yourself for, you know, something more than. So that will help you to cross the, uh, the fear zone. Then only you'll be moving into the learning zone. All right. Thank you, sir for that wonderful answer. I have one more question from Felix uh, Compoundi. He says, oftentimes we get so many blocks along the way, something like psychological uh, psychological or research block that puts you on the rock bottom and waste some time before figuring it out. What will be the best way of avoiding this wastage of time? I think I have spoken uh, about it during my deliberation. I said I recommend PhD students not to have Facebook active. <laughs> I wanted to deactivate Facebook for two years or three years. Uh, um, possibly uh, keep your handphone aside when you work. Uh, you have to have. You have to start a habit like living life without a smartphone. Uh, the smartphone. The guy who invented the smartphone. Last month, I saw a statement by him. He said, if you want to enjoy your life, then better put your smartphone aside, right? <laughs> and and, and what, what is his name? The, the, the Facebook guy, Zuckerberg, right? Mark Zuckerberg. He says he doesn't have a Facebook account. His wife keeps none of them has Facebook account because it's simply just a waste of time. So you have to know what is meaningful in your life. Whatever you do, make it meaningful. Look at whether it is going to add value in your life. Okay, so if you if you learn how to do that, then you should be able to stop wasting the time. And laziness is a normal behavior and attitude of people, uh, and that kills uh, many intelligent people. I see many of my friends I have seen uh, with good potentials, and their their career have been ruined. Uh, they couldn't live up to the full potentials uh, given by the creator you know it's just because of the laziness laziness huh? feel 
you know, comfortable. Uh, having a cup of tea takes even half an hour. Talking to friends uh, over the phone, sitting together, gossiping, talk, chit chat, and all that. A researcher cannot be like that. Every second has a value for you. Every second has a value for you. Okay. If you know how to value time, I'm very sure you will be able to stop wasting your time. Time are very precious. Has gone, never get back. Okay. Right. Thank you, sir, for that answer. Now I have one more question by Norman Knight Knight Hill. He says, thank you, sir. It was inspiring for me to do more harder. My big issue is finding a supervisor. No one is answering the email. And his question is, how to find a supervisor? All right. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, you may want to find uh, the university that you feel uh, that uh, convenient for you. So if you feel like you want to pursue PhD in your country, then find that university. Or uh, if you feel like, no, I want to go to a certain country, find that university first. Then visit the faculty and look at it. And of course, you can email. If they do not respond, meaning that that person is not interested. Uh, the normal procedure is what? If you cannot find anybody, uh, you are not familiar with anyone in that university, in particular faculty, you can just submit the application. The process is, once the application is submitted in the Center or for Graduate Studies or Institute of Postgraduate Studies, they will circulate the application to the faculty. So if your application falls, say, for example, like mine, Finance Division, then um, this application would be circulated among the finance professors and professors who are eligible to supervise you. Then one of them will say, OK, I'm willing to supervise him. Then we will send you the offer letter. So it's not really necessary for you to find a supervisor before you enroll, uh, unless you have an objective in mind that I need funding. So I have to find a good supervisor who has good research, good amount of research grant, who can pay me for that. That is a different. So if they do not respond to you, meaning that he already have his students with him, and he cannot give you any more fund, that's why he's not responding. OK? No man. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is this question. I mean, um, I'm just raising because she has asked. Ingwati says, thank you, Professor. Possible for us to get the presentation slide? Usually, I share my presentation slide with the participants. Uh, I will share with uh, Dr. Amani Shorner. Uh, but I may take out one part because I just submitted the paper, and the paper has not been published yet. Huh? Uh, the constructive approach uh, to choose a research topic that is taken from a paper which is not published yet. So that part I will take out and then only I will share with Dr. Ramani and you can all collect from her, okay? Yes, thank you, sir. Now I have uh, Yusuf Bala Zaria. Is he still there? Uh, unmute yourself, Yusuf, and you can ask your question if you are there. Yusuf? Um, sir, I don't see his response. Abhimanyu, you can go ahead, unmute yourself, and you can ask your question. Thank you, Abhimanyu. Yes, sir. sir, how to deal with writer's block? Writer's Sorry? block. Writer's block. When we are writing okay. something, we are uh, like ideas do not come up. How to deal with that particular scenario? Um, can you come again? Uh, I did not really get your question. Sir, he is asking about writing slow. Am I right, Abhimanyu? Yes, ma'am. When we are to write something, ideas are do not coming. So how to deal with that particular situation? Sir, for example, you know, uh, we are reading a lot of papers. Everything is there. However, we, I'm unable to write. Is that what you're asking us, Abhimanyu? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> I, I, have, I have proposed a template whereby it helps you to summarize a paper. And uh, once you summarize from there, somehow we have to start writing. Uh, writing is an art, and it takes uh, quite a long time to adapt to it. Uh, my, my personal experience when I wrote my first, first paper took quite a long time. And then when I pass it to somebody to check, my friend uh, doing PhD with me, 
and when he gave it to me back, uh, I, I was like uh, very frustrated, you know, I was, I was very frustrated. <laughs> because so many comments, uh, it's like everything is wrong. And then when I started submitting to journal, I, I was getting rejection from this journal, that journal, that journal, and all, all happened. So finally, after publishing 20, 30 papers, we know exactly what we're supposed to write. Even writing an abstract for a journal, it took me some time, you know, two, three years to master on it, how to write an abstract for a journal paper. So this all, uh, everything, you know, everything, it takes some time. If you are very good in playing football, uh, Abhimanyu, uh, if you are very good in playing football, uh, did you start first day and uh, you just become a very good player? No, right? You may not be able to shoot the ball correctly. And uh, even after playing three, four years, you still should go somewhere. And finally, after a lot of practices, you become very proficient in it. So everything that you do in the world, there is an art in it. And you have to learn that and you only learn through practice right as we say practice makes a man perfect <laughs> so you have to start writing you start writing show it to your friend your colleagues uh, your relatives tell them how can they help you you know uh, to improve and they will guide you to how to improve all that so that you start that way sharing with people personally myself even until now when i write a paper and I submit a journal before that i will share this paper with two three colleagues tell them uh, please go through give me some feedback okay so so that's what you're supposed to do or you start writing whatever it comes in mind just write just you start writing and then pass it to somebody and i'll ask you to help supervisors will always do that okay so supervisors will help you to do that Thank you, sir. uh that's yeah one more maybe it's a comment from his side professor i think there is there are disadvantages of being supervised by senior professors with responsibility they are always engaged so uh, <laughs> your, uh, your uh, comments on that also sir um well i i will disagree uh, i will agree and disagree with both <laughs> Not all senior professors will always be busy, but they love to supervise you. Uh, the senior professors, they are knowledgeable. Uh, they should be. They should be. They should be sharing their knowledge. They should be transferring their knowledge to you. So they should be always free for you. And uh, what I would suggest you to do is find a professor who doesn't have an admin role, administrative role in his faculty. Then you will get him free. If you get a professor who has an administrative role in the faculty, like dean, deputy dean, chairman, or something like that, he may not have time for you. But people like me, who doesn't have any administrative role, uh, I'm always available in the office. Anytime my student can see me, at any time. My doors are always open. So it, it is true for some cases. It may not be true for certain cases, OK? So <laughs> it's up to you. I think there's one more question I see uh, from Bashir uh, Mikhail. Usman, he says, hello, professor, for qualitative or quantitative research. Can PLSM be used for both analysis? No, no, no. PLSM is for quantitative, definitely quantitative. If you're going for qualitative, the most two popular software now is NVivo and Atlasti. NVivo and Atlasti, these two are the most popular ones. The quantitative, then if you are doing um, panel data, it is Stata. Uh, but if you are going for some uh, uh, having framework and testing hypotheses with uh, primary data and all that, definitely you can go for SPSS. Uh, for time series analysis, you go for SPSS. If you are testing hypotheses and all that, now we go for smart PLS. Okay. Uh, uh, sir, Nuruddin Iser is asking, I don't know, uh, when will be the second presentation? Are you asking for another lecture from sir's side? Nuruddin, we will be working if that is your question. I don't know. Uh, when will be the second presentation, please? That's what he has asked. What is your question, Pradeep? Yes, uh, my question, sir, is uh, from the which um, WhatsApp group. I see that there are two presentations okay. today. <laughs> okay, just give me so a few uh, seconds. Give me a few seconds. I give you the link for uh, tonight's session. That is uh, from my YouTube channel. Just give me a few seconds. I give you the link. Uh, you can attend the session. 
would be dr shona would you allow me to do that to share the link uh, please and i think we all should take the approval if some of the participants from here are eager to join can they join that presentation it's open it's open for everyone okay and Thank uh, you, sir. i i copy i hope that okay copy the link uh, i go to session and the message paste okay i am giving you the link uh today's tonight session actually i am doing a, a series of sessions on how to write phd thesis oh, okay. so i have already done three sessions how to write chapter one how to write chapter two and how to write chapter three i have done that already tonight malaysian time 9 30 9 30 pm would be indian time would be 7 pm i'm going to present uh, my uh, discussion on how to write chapter four Okay, so I'm going to have series of uh, presentation through my YouTube channel That's to, to basically help the PhD student. It looks like very popular. I see the first writing chapter one, two, three, only three weeks. There are more than 2,000 uh, viewers, you know. Uh, so it looks like you don't really uh, need that kind of uh, uh, discussions. So tonight will be on chapter four, the data analysis and findings, so the chap that does chapter. So if you're interested, I've given you the link there. You can join me uh, Indian time at 7 p.m. or Malaysian time would be 9.30 p.m. Sure. Usually the session will be about one and a half hours time. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, there is another question which has come from Vidya Sagar Kumar, sir. What are the links of social medias like YouTube channels? Uh, Vidya, sir, are you asking uh, the link for sir's channel specifically or is there something else that you are looking? Because we are not clear with your question. So can you just unmute yourself and tell us, or you can uh, put it your question correctly in the chat box. Uh, so there is one more question from Zazan Ibrahim. How case control design be analyzed? Okay, just, just give me a second what I do. Um, uh, okay. Uh, uh, Okay, I'm, I'm there. Uh, in case uh, if you want to get into my YouTube channel, I'm, I'm going to give you the link. I think the desktop, this has to be not over there. Okay, that's my YouTube channel link. Uh, you, you can go there and find. I think there's 110 videos all about research method. If you want to learn that, you can get through that. Uh, can I arrange, please, contact MMR? That is to you. This question is to you, La, Dr. Uh, Ramani? <laughs> yes, sir. I would be taking care uh, for the season as well. Fine. Okay. And now I have one more question from Charles. Can you arrange, please, to conduct a MMR, especially exploratory? Is it uh, for me, Charles, or for sir? I think it's the question to you, I think. <laughs> okay. We would be uh, coming up, Nurad, uh, Charles, uh, for on um, mixed method research uh, completely. And uh, yes. Um, I'm uh, inviting Dr. Fetters or one of his team members. So I'm just waiting for the date. So it would be announced and all of you can join up. It's again a pre-session. So kindly wait. Uh, I, I'm just waiting for the date from his side. Sir, he is asking about your... Okay, sir has already shared. And Dr. Haider Al-Hashimi, Professor, do you consider changing the research topic after one year time wasting for the student now he's a faculty sir so a question from the faculty you know <laughs> i i personally do not think that uh, uh, the time is spent by a student for research is a waste of time he has explored into an area and uh, he had learned many things so he may change the topic but it's still the learning the journey that he have gone through will be helpful say for example I plan to travel from, uh, uh, say, Delhi to Calcutta. And after going uh, halfway through, I decided I don't want to go to Calcutta. Somehow I want to go to Madras. So the journey that I had uh, from uh, Delhi to Calcutta would be somehow useful for me to uh, the next journey from Delhi to Madras. Okay. <laughs> uh, if you cannot really cope with the topic, of course, 
You need to change. It doesn't matter how long. I did change after six months. And Dr. Hashimi has raised his hand. Please, yes, sir. Uh, please, you can, you can uh, express. Unmute. Sir, you can unmute yourself, Dr. Haider. Thank you. Salam, Prof. Uh, I'm Dr. Haider from University of Basra. Actually, your lecture was very interesting. Uh, uh, for me, I have graduated from University of Technology in Malaysia uh, before 10 years. I did my PhD. So I uh, ran on this problem. After one year of my research, my supervisor uh, asked me to change my topic. Because from his point of view, he said that uh, the topic that I was working on uh, will need more time to be implemented and to be tested. So uh, it will affect my graduation time. So I told him uh, this specifically. Uh, so what about the time I have wasted on my research? So he, his answer was very interesting for me. He said, no, it's all from the process of learning. It yes, added yes. to your knowledge. Yes. So uh, that's why uh, I have uh, uh, been very, uh, the, the time I spent the one year was uh, been very useful for me to complete Definitely. my research in time. Though yes. I changed my topic completely to a new area of research, and we had a one hour discussion at that time, and I have asked him only one question to give me the research area, because at that time, he said that as PhD student, uh, you need to choose the area that you desire to do your research on. Uh, so it was a very good journey. And I, alhamdulillah, I have completed my research in uh, within two and a half years and submitted to Viva. So it was good. It was good that the supervisor has advised you to change the topic, right? Yes, of course, <laughs> of course. So not uh, every time the supervisor uh, asks a student to change his topic, that means it's a waste of time. It's, it's not a waste of time, definitely, because uh, you are on the journey and you, you learn certain things uh, and the skills, uh, those are useful to carry on and continue your journey, definitely. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Welcome, Doctor. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Heather. Uh, sir, we have the question from Zazan Ibrahim. How can case control design be analyzed and reported by using SPSS? Now, uh, the case control, uh, if you have quantitative data, huh? if you have quantitative data, it can be used in SPSS. Now, depending on what kind of uh, research objectives you have, if you want to taste the differences, use ANOVA. You want to taste uh, similarities, use uh, chi-square. If you want to analyze correlation, use correlation analysis. You want to find out the if you use regression. So it depends on what kind of research question you have in mind. And based on that, you determine which kind of research, uh, the statistical tests you are going to use, okay? So if you are using case control, but the data is quantitative, it can be used in SPSS, no problem. I happen to have a few students from University of Science Malaysia doing PhD in physics and even in chemistry. And still, I can help them with the spaces eh? <laughs> because the data are quantitative. And recently, there was one PhD student doing medical, eh? medical PhD in uh, medical field. Uh, and the data was quantitative. So I use spaces to help her, eh? help her to complete a PhD. So it doesn't matter what area you are, as long as the data is quantitative, it can be analyzed using spaces. Yes, sir. Um, any other questions? Because in the chat box, I haven't, uh, I'm not able to see any more questions. Um, maybe if somebody else would like to go ahead and question him, please kindly unmute yourself and you can feel free to ask, sir, because he's available right now. So, you know, any question that you would like to ask. I think you are face to face in Google Meet, so you should be asking more questions. That's what I expected. Yes. Because, uh, yeah, because last few sessions I'm on YouTube live, so you don't have a chance to ask question orally right in the chat box. But tonight also, I know, uh, uh, Dr. Ramani, actually, uh, your session, I did not promote in my own webinar groups. Uh -oh. uh, so you limited, uh, I, I thought you, you have your own uh, network, so I did not. See, if I promote it, you may have got a uh, uh, few hundred there, you know. But I thought since you have your own network, I didn't want to promote that. I didn't know. Huh? You should have told me that. 
anyway it's so all right i had um, um you know quite a lot of groups and uh, maybe due to the time because from mexico they sent me a message that saying that if we have to attend this particular session um it would be around 2:30 to 3 o'clock in the morning mm. so they said uh, can we uh, if you don't mind can you please give us the video recording and we would love to go ahead and see otherwise they were apologizing it that you know it mm. becomes very difficult Oh, yes, yeah, cool. that's why that's the reason. Uh, most of my sessions I do uh, Malaysian time nine thirty would be like seven p.m. and Indian time. Oh, so seven okay. p.m. Indian time would be in the U.S. would be like uh, nine nine a.m. You know. That's right. Because, sure. because I do always get some participants from U.S. Even I do get participants from Germany, Spain, Italy. So I have to take care of that. You know. So my sessions would be always uh, at night in Malaysia, even though it be. Taxing for me, but I I said okay. Uh, you know, I I accommodate myself with that. So I would be inviting you once again for another topic after uh, maybe a couple of weeks like that, and maybe we can arrange it at that time as suggested from your side, so that we can have more uh, participants also. Now, Vidya Sagar, oh, Doctor Heather is saying right now it is two a.m. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor no Heather, uh, being with us. We really appreciated that also. And Vidya Sagar is asking us one more question, sir. Quickly, can we use systematic literature review as research design for dissertation? Um, research design and uh, systematic literature review are two totally different things, right? Uh, when we talk about research design, we have about five types of research design. Uh, descriptive exploratory explanatory and all those right uh, th those definitely you do not need systematic literature review to decide on that okay uh, we look at uh, uh, the research problem that is identified and defined the nature of the problem and then we look at uh, the previous researches what kind of you know better than uh, actually in the research methodology as a flow if you listen to my presentation of how to write chapter three you will understand the flow we start with Philosophical foundation of research. This is, you know, uh, positivism, pragmatism, uh, really relativism. You know, we come from there. Then we go to research approach, deductive or inductive. Then we come down to uh, research method, qualitative or quantitative. Then we come down to research design. So there is a flow for it. There is a flow for it. Okay, you have to follow that flow uh, in order to decide what kind of uh, research design you would like to have. The systematic literature review will help you. To select the select the right kind of literature that should be included in your literature review, and then extract the right kind of variable and theories that will be essential for you. Okay. Yes, Abhimanyu, you can unmute yourself and you can ask, sir. Sir, uh, I have a query on the like the nature of the variables and the quantum of the variables to be used in a study. Like as you have pointed out, when we are doing a review of literature, we are getting some variables from there. and from the last section of the research papers like suggestion more we could also uh, have some variables from that also so uh, by this phenomena we would be having some variables which are very much grounded in the literature we can always quote them in detail on the other hand we have some variables which are suggested like future course of action could be taken how to take this both set of variables in our study because on one hand we have Solid literature, second hand, nothing new. And what would be the right mixture? What would be the right quantum of the variables to be used over here? Well, when you read about, I, I would say for PhD student, you have to read the forty key papers from heart. You know everything of those forty key papers. Okay, so when you read forty papers, and you summarize the variables, you may boil it down to say twenty independent variables, and uh, five six theories in a research. You will take only about five factors. You see, so look at your problem and look at the context, the research premise. If you are doing research from India or Nigeria, say for example, or from Malaysia, that is your research premise. So connect your problem with the premise and see which theory is more applicable to solve this phenomenon that you have. So say for example, you choose one theory and then you got four variables. But if I find a lot of studies done on it, there's nothing new can be shown. Then we decided to take another theory. We combine two theories, integrate two theories. You take two variables from one theory, two variables from another theory. So integrate. So you are proposing a new framework. But still, a lot of studies being done. So what can you do? 
So you take one variable from literature, suggestion for future research, put that in the framework, and that's supposed to be completely new, is going to be your uh, contribution. So you are going to propose a new framework in that kind of research, and you are introducing a new variable, and at the end, if you find it is significant, that is your contribution. That gives you the PhD. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. sir uh, I have a one follow-up question as well. Many times when we are publishing it, uh, the research paper, so it is uh, like uh, seek by the reviewers to have a theoretical framework for your research. And when we are as a like beginners in research, uh, research scholars, so we are just taking the variables, not having a very solid theoretical framework to go about the things. We collect the data, we analyze it. Thereafter, when we write the paper, now it is to be reverse engineer. How to go about that particular phenomenon, like getting a theory, theory after writing a paper, or like uh, putting it into a particular uh, design. No, of course, uh, when when you are doing a PhD study, I always emphasize on two things. One is your philosophical foundation, huh? uh, and in that case, you have to have good understanding of ontology and epistemology. Uh, PhD is doctor of philosophy. You don't call it doctor of marketing or doctor of chemistry. We don't. Doctor of philosophy. So there should be philosophical background. To understand it, you have to have understanding on ontology and epistemology. That one you have to understand. It's a must. To me, it's a must. And then after that, theoretical underpinning, theoretical uh, support. So, so any variable you take, there should be some theory. The framework you design, there should be a theoretical underpinning. So you may have one underpinning theory. It could be enough sometimes. Sometimes could be one underpinning theory as one supporting theory, or even could be one underpinning theory, two, three supporting theory. That's how you come into. But when you finish your study, you have to publish paper. It it all up to you. You have to learn to multi multiply. You know, from one research, uh, you should have minimum four to five papers, and that one you have to learn how to do that. Okay. Did I answer your question? I'm not very sure. Yes, sir. I like I got uh, insights from this particular argument. How we can go about the things. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, thank all you. Right. Okay. I think there is one uh, Bashir is saying, I think we equally advise our university to provide a crying room. <laughs> and sir, even Zazen has a question, how abstract is written? <laughs> um, uh, tonight I'm going to have uh, a session on how to write chapter 4. And then next week I will have a session on how to write chapter 5. But after writing chapter 5, the session at the end, I will teach you how to write an abstract. Uh, in my YouTube channel also, you can see there are two specific webinar videos available, very exhaustive one. One is writing and publishing paper in index journal. Other one is writing paper for high impact journal. These two are webinars that I have given talk, one in UTM, University of Technology Malaysia, one I have given in Indonesia. This webinar video is available and I have extensive discussion on how to write an abstract, okay? So you have to listen to the videos to understand it. <laughs> Right, and these are available on your uh, channel, right, sir? Yes, he's available. And also, if uh, uh, Dr. Ramani allows me, this video would be also available in my uh, YouTube channel. Of course, yes, sir. They have requested me that for every uh, master class, I should upload them in my uh, channel. I'll be sharing the link. You can upload it even in your channel also, sir. All There's right. no problem. We can have it in both the sites also. So I sure. think, uh, uh, do you consider, I think that's the end and I don't see any other questions. Uh, yes. I mean, we still have seven minutes. So in case uh, some of you are really looking forward to share or comment or, um, you know, ask him any doubt, he's still available. Dr. Haida, you may also give some suggestions, uh, some tips to the participants. Yes. Uh, how can they make their PhD journey uh, comfortable, uh, enjoyable? Uh, <laughs> pro, pro, prof, you have uh, covered everything. <laughs> but uh, my only advice is working hard. Okay. I have said that, right? Uh, that my first yes, slide yes, is. You, about, you have covered everything. My first slide, I say, is all about hard work and confidence. Uh, I study. How to work on confidence and how to manage the time. Time management yes. is very important to, during yes. PhD. Yes. Time management. Uh, Dr. Ramani yes. also was talking about it. Uh, uh, time is very precious. Uh, every second is important, especially yes, when you are doing PhD. Every second, every minute is important. And keeping you mentally and healthy fit 
uh, this uh, is the main important thing the mental health is yes. very important during the phd journey yes that's why well you know what happened when i got into my physically when i become unfit when i was doing my phd uh, i was hospitalized you know i was diagnosed with helicobacter pylori there was a bacterial infection in my stomach it's because i was under stress and i was skipping meals i was not taking meal on time and that affected my stomach and i suffered you know i suffered a lot. then i went what, what? To, when i was not recovering uh, you know fully so i went to singapore for the checkup the singapore uh, doctor, he, he told doctor, me that, doctor, yes doctor had that uh, during my my study uh, time uh, uh, one of the professors that took the research methodology advised the students at that time that when the student feels in a stress he should take a time break yes yes so that's what time i was trying to say. yes, yes. You, 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 you mentioned that before a time break mm -hmm. uh, the student should go out and take a notebook with him yeah if he has an idea so he can write it down during the mm -hmm. his rest his rest mm -hmm. time because during the rest time and during the the, the student uh, taking cover from his stress maybe some good ideas will, will come to him for his research because you know that the mind keeps working for the students especially for those who want to complete in time they always think about their research even if they are far away from doing the research in the lab or, or in their uh, in their home they keep thinking uh, unintentionally of course because uh, that's how the mind works if uh, someone has a problem and needs to be solving he keeps thinking of it so it's uh, a good habit if someone has a notebook with him during his rest time if he has any idea he can write it down because it may be uh, forgotten uh, during the time he needs to return and uh, go back to his research. Yes. So, so what I was trying to say that, you know, I, I went to Singapore to meet a specialist. Uh, when I met the doctor, the doctor says, no, I'm not going to do anything, not going to give you any medicine. He gave me five advice. Could be helpful for you. Number one, he said, make sure you do find time to do meditation it's very popular in india india the culture is very strong on it meditation uh, what do you call it yoga right uh, dr ramani yes sir. yoga okay. is there then we have reiki is there um, okay. i would say Medit meditation is also there meditation he, he told me that before you go to bed or after you wake up you find a time for muslim after for the prayer or after isha prayer you can do that say about 10 15 minutes you close your eyes find a place you are there you close your eyes and go out from the world okay so leave everything so the stress will go out that's our meditation that's the first second he said that you must exercise at least 30 minutes per day 30 minutes minimum so in the evening you go out you would go for jogging for running for any game so in the morning after waking up you go for jogging running that is a must that's what he told me number one is meditation number two exercise number three never skip any meals and take meal on time do not eat when you are hungry eat before you become hungry before before you eat you should be eating at time he's told me you know eat if you eat take breakfast at eight o'clock make sure every day eight o'clock that's what he told me and uh, together he also advised me never eat full stomach you eat five times especially those people have stomach issues never eat full stomach huh? and that's also for muslim you know you're supposed to eat half you know one third of the stomach food one third is water one third is supposed to be free so so that's what he told me you know he was uh, an indian malaysian doctor but works in singapore okay so that's what the third one huh? third one he said uh, break the meals like go for five times eating. I think many country we do that, right? We have breakfast at 11 o'clock, we go for a tea, then we have lunch, then at five o'clock, we go for a tea again, then later we go for dinner like five times already. Some even go for supper at night. So that is the number three one, right? Uh, number four, he said minimum, uh, you should be drinking water of minimum three liter. Three liter minimum. Three liter minimum, okay? So, and number five, he told me that he will give me a list the food i should eat i should not eat huh? the certain food there you know we we eat food for living is we do not live to eat right we eat to live <laughs> so
so we have to make sure we we eat the fruit that make us healthy and uh, uh, happy and, and and all that. So any food that affects me, we should not be eating that. Huh? Uh, Tun Dr. Mahathir, Malaysian Prime Minister before, right? He said the food that he loves most, he will eat less. The food he hates, he will eat most. <laughs> Meaning that he's trying to say that if you follow, uh, you know, the kind of thing we like sweets and all that, uh, that doesn't be definitely not helpful. So that's the five suggestion was given by the doctor to me. I think it would be helpful to many of you who are now currently uh, undergoing uh, or undertaking the PhD journey. Okay, let me answer. There's another question, Dr. Ramani. He says, what is the difference between the scope of the study and the research limitation? Yes, sir. The scope of the, the scope of the study is written in chapter one, whereby you will, uh, it's a very small section. Uh, you will tell exactly what are you going to do in terms of knowledge scope, your boundary of knowledge, in terms of data collection, in terms of geographical locations. You will tell ex exactly the scope of your study, the premise of your research in terms of knowledge, in terms of uh, area geography, you know, in terms of data collection. That's what you are going to identify and you are going to spell it in chapter one. And once you have completed your research, you will find out that, say, for example, your R square is 50%. What does it mean? It means your framework captured 50% variables only. 50% variables have not been discovered in your study. So that is a limitation, right? <laughs> so you are going to recommend future researchers should be doing that, all that, to cover up the limitations. Okay. So limitations, there could be many. Say, for example, when you have collected data, you found out that certain age groups are more, certain age groups are not there at all. It's a limitation. You found out that uh, highly qualified, uh, highly educated, are more or less educated, uh, not there, you know, a minority groups had been captured in the sample, or sort of limitation, any limitation that you have. You just list it down in chapter five, and then followed by a suggestion for future research to cover you up, right? But again, when you are writing the research uh, limitations, make sure you do not write anything that jeopardizes your research work. You should not be belittling you, all right? Do not expose everything there, all the weakness. Tell one the thing that doesn't really affect you seriously. That Those are things you should be exposing. Do not say something like, uh, your research is not worthy at all, you know. <laughs> Many students will do that. Uh, and then I, as an examiner, when I go, I'll tell the student, hey, you are killing yourself. Why should you be doing that? You do not have to expose everything, all weaknesses that we have, right? Thank you. Dr. Ramani, we cannot hear you. I think your voice sometimes comes uh, very, very low. Uh, is, it, is it better now? We still, you are not audible. Audible now, sir? Yes, and now so okay. I think uh, that was the last question that I could see in the chat box. After that, Yusuf has apologized for missing the questioning period uh, because he has to go to the restroom and he says that he has enjoyed the workshop. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's what he has to say for us. So, sir, I think we have come to the end of the session. I really enjoyed all the challenges which were enumerated and i think of uh, these uh, knowing these challenges is also mandatory for us maybe one of us uh, in future can take up it also as a phd topic as to see what kind of challenges uh, a student or a scholar is facing you know or we can come up with few uh, interviews where we can uh, pick up the scholars and see how the challenges are being mapped about now, I thoroughly enjoyed each and every slide of yours, sir, and they are really practical. And I think um, each one of us would agree with you that, yes, these challenges are there. And the remedies that you have given to us, how to uh, overcome these challenges, was very nicely explained from your side, sir. So I, on behalf of JFJS Research Center, thank you for such a wonderful um, I should say presentation from your side and the interaction with some of the members who were present out here, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Welcome. Okay. All right, so and those of you are there, if you're interested, you can join me tonight. Uh, see you tonight. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> to be very honest, Aminul, sir, I keep watching your videos because there are so many things wherein I get stuck up. 
I know it. Um, I learned from you about antecedents and consequence. The variable, the way you have explained, I haven't seen any book explaining it. Similarly, uh, when you are looking at the variables, how to understand them before even you can start off. So, you know, learning from your videos has always been uh, marvelous for me. And I learned a lot also, sir, from those videos. So I would um, recommend and suggest each one of you, please go ahead, subscribe to his channel. And I, sh uh, I think you should be available at 7 o'clock Indian time. Um, as he has said, he's going to give us one more presentation. And whenever he is, if you subscribe, definitely, yes, notification is coming in. Apart from that, even I have got my own uh, channel on YouTube, uh, which has got more than uh, 1,000 videos sir, on different, different topics. Um, qualitative research is wherein I'm focusing currently. And apart from NVivo and Atlas TI, which sir has mentioned, I'm focusing on Max QDA. That is another uh, popular uh, qualitative research tool that we have got, number one. And I'm one of the professional trainers. So if somebody is really looking forward, um, you know, you can uh, let me know. We can arrange uh, some training sessions for your school or for your college also, sir. So that is one thing that I wanted to add. Otherwise, this was the show for Aminul, sir. And I thank him with my folded hands for such a wonderful this thing. And yes, I would uh, share it via mail to all of you. I would be sending up your this thing. So in that, uh, my YouTube channel link also will be presented to each one of you. Thank you, sir. And I would be inviting you once again. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the participants for joining guys. Thank you and take care and have a wonderful weekend. Rest, as sir has suggested, Eat proper meals, good fruits are available. So meditation, little bit of it, and carry forward with your research journey also. Thank you. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye. See you some other time. Bye, <laughs> sir. Yes, sir.